Well, please join me in thanking our panelists, Khaldun, Carol, and Yasser. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, His Excellency Imran Khan, and from Sky News Arabia, our moderator, Ms. Lubna Boza. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to be part of the FII this year. I'm happy to see a full house and so many familiar faces in the audience. So we've got 40 minutes to discuss Pakistani's economy and to discuss the uh, emerging opportunities that might provide. So good morning and thank you for making the time. Your Excellency, you've assumed office as Prime Minister in August 2018 uh, with the mission to achieve Naya Pakistan, New Pakistan. Tell us more about it. Well, thank you. First of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here. Opportunity to uh, talk about Pakistan, investment opportunities. But Naya Pakistan, is actually uh, the Pakistan it was meant to be. Pakistan was the only state, well, one of the two states made in the name of an ideology which was Islam. So when we talk about Naya Pakistan, it is going back to the vision of the founding fathers of Pakistan. And what the founding fathers of Pakistan envisaged was a state based on the principles of the first Islamic state of Medina. And that's, those principles were justice, meritocracy, a welfare state where the state took responsibility for the weaker section of the society, and above all, state to educate its people. So these were the principles which, very lofty principles, uh, why Pakistan came into being. So when we talk about Naya Pakistan, it means going back to the principles of the, uh, uh, what the founding fathers stood for. And uh, hence, the struggle to educate our people, develop our human resources, strengthen our institutions, especially of justice, um, and, uh, you know, sadly, sadly for us, some of those principles are more visible in, say, the Scandinavian republics, say, in Switzerland, say, in New Zealand, than uh, uh, in, um, in, in Pakistan, what was supposed to be an example for what an ideal Muslim state was supposed to be. Uh, you've mentioned so many important uh, points that I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, one by one. So. Uh, working on human capital, fighting corruption, and powering the economy. Walk us through the economic agenda of your government now. Well, you know, we have uh, been in power for 60 days. We have inherited two big deficits, fiscal deficit, current account deficit. And so the immediate concern for our government is to um, in, in, increase our exports. We need to increase our exports because we have shortage of uh, foreign reserves because of our current account deficit. We need to 
uh, get more remittances through the banking channels because there are about eight to nine million Pakistanis who work abroad, who are living abroad. So we need to, to bolster our foreign exchange reserves, immediate uh, improvement in exports, giving incentives to the exporters, getting Pakistanis to send remittances through the banking channels because then um, you know, we would have enough dollars. Uh, at the same time, clamping down on money laundering it's a problem in most of the developing world where the money leaves uh, the country through illegal channels. Um, and then create the opportunities for investment. So this, this, these are the immediate measures we have been taking in these two months. Uh, and uh, obviously, to uh, get through this difficult period, we're looking for loans. And, and that's actually my ne next question, because with, sh with such an ambitious agenda, you require um, resources. Um, how does your government plan to overcome the existing uh, financing gap? Are we talking about loans, IMF program? What are the options you have on the table? Well, uh, you know, whatever reforms we do today, the impact will be in maybe three months, six months, a year's time. So right now we need to uh, uh, have loans to go through this difficult period of repaying our, uh, or servicing our debts uh, for our imports. So we are talking to both IMF and also we are talking to um, friendly governments that we could um, have, uh, go through this difficult period to have, get loans. So, so you might be applying for another IMF program? Yes, we're talking to the IMF. What we are hoping is that we can do a bit of both, get some loans from friendly governments, uh, at the same time uh, uh, get a loan from the IMF. And so to go through this period, which we feel we have a tough uh, period for the next three to six months. I'm going to go uh, back to the point you mentioned in your first um, answer. So uh, during your victory speech, your main point was fighting corruption in Pakistan uh, and powering the economy. Um, how is your government aiming to ensure transparency so you can revive the investors' confidence in Pakistan and investing in Pakistan? Firstly, Lubna, you must understand that um, corruption is what makes a country poor. Corruption is the main difference between the developed world and the developing world. Uh, countries are not poor because they lack resources. For instance, Congo has so many resources. It's one of the most resource-rich area in the world, as opposed to Switzerland, which comparatively hardly has any resources. The difference is that what corruption does is, it does two things. One, it destroys state institutions. When the ruling elite is corrupt, it can only make money by destroying all those institutions that are check and balance in the way of uh, corruption. And secondly, corruption diverts money from human development to mega projects which give mega kickbacks which leave a country indebted. So Switzerland is one of the most prosperous countries in the world because it has very good governance. It has strong state institutions and it uses the money to develop its human resources. So in Pakistan, the challenge is how do we strengthen our institutions enough to make it impossible for people to be corrupt or corruption at a level which is manageable and secondly, divert the resources to develop our human resources. This is the challenge of Pakistan. So what we've been trying to do since we've been, since we've been uh, 60 days in power is to strengthen the state institutions, develop meritocracy. Uh, uh, the reasons why state institutions get destroyed is because cronies have been put in key positions who then, uh, once, uh, uh, once there is no meritocracy in a state institution it, and there's no rule of law, the state institutions do not prevent anyone from uh, stealing money from the country. So this has been the main agenda of our party. And then secondly, to prioritize uh, uh, institutions that will help the exporters. So hence, we have, uh, we have made all the laws at the moment to help our exporters. 
Um, and employment also is a main concern for you. You've been very uh, concerned uh, about youth and employment, uh, training uh, youth to be able to find jobs and creating jobs. Tell us more about the agenda in that particular field. Pakistan has 100 million people below the age of 35. Yes. Now, in one way, that's a huge opportunity. But secondly, it is a big uh, pressure on the government to find employment for this young population. We have uh, embarked on a very ambitious program. Pakistan has 10 million shortage of houses. So we have embarked on this program that in the first five years, we will build 5 million houses. And so hence creating all the conditions, removing all the red tape that comes into the housing sector. Also, of course, trying to attract foreign investment for this housing. At the same time, apart from the housing, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, create the enabling environment for investment. One of Pakistan's strengths are the overseas Pakistanis. We have, as I said before, eight to nine million Pakistanis working abroad. We have, if we create the enabling environment, we will then be able to attract their investment. Um, if you see the, the growth of China and India, one of the biggest, the first people who invested were the overseas Indians and overseas Chinese who came back. So we have this uh, big resource lying outside Pakistan. Our main effort is to create the enabling environment, make it easy to do business, the ease of doing business, cost of doing, bringing down the cost of doing business and attracting this, attack, uh, this uh, investment. Speaking of China, you've always spoke about how good China um, is in, in bringing 700 million uh, people f uh, out of poverty. Uh, so, um, and I think the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or what you call CIPIC, is being debated a lot lately. Um, I, I would like to understand more about it from, from a Pakistan angle. Uh, first of all, let me just say two things about China, which, uh, which for Pakistanis is, is very attractive. One is that uh, China is the only country in human history which brought out 700 million people out of poverty in 30 years. Secondly, China has in the last five, six years really clamped down on corruption. Uh, in the last four years, they t I think they convicted about 415 government ministers in corruption cases. So these are the two problems which, we, you know, which face Pakistan. We have, uh, we have corruption, and so we are going to look for ways, because white-collar crime is very difficult, uh, especially in our countries, to, uh, to catch, because we do not have the people. Absolutely. We do not have uh, those who understand, who can convict uh, white-collar criminals. So we are, we are going to get help from China. And secondly, all the ways, the, the way they have uh, brought this, uh, this huge amount of humanity out of poverty. So poverty allevi alleviation is the second thing which, we'll, which we learn from China, and I, I'm going there uh, next month. So we hope to, uh, you know, we've already asked uh, the Chinese government to help us in these two areas. CPEC is a great opportunity for Pakistan. CPEC connects us to China, which is one of the biggest markets. Because of CPEC, we are developing Gawadar, which is after Singapore, the second deepest port. And because of CPAC, we are developing these special economic zones where, where we will invite investments from, from all over. So hence, uh, uh, provided we get our governance structure right, CPAC is a great opportunity for Pakistan. And actually, that leads, leads to my second question, that this whole collaboration with China, how can it help Pakistan bring more international investors? Well, simply because uh, China a, is a huge market. Secondly, connected this, the CPEC is this route which connects us, China, right down to Gwadar. So um, we have all this opportunity uh, with these special economic zones to invite people. Uh, it gives a great opportunity for investment. And remember Pakistan's strategic position. It is sitting next to two of the biggest markets, India on one side, China there, and then, of course, Inshallah, when peace returns to Afghanistan, 
Then we have this uh, uh, all the way to Central Asia. So it's, Pakistan is strategically probably you know, one, of the, one of those countries blessed. It is placed in one of the uh, great positions in, in, in the geography of the world. And, and actually, uh, I would like to comment on this point, but because rightly so, you know, like Pakistan is very well placed to connect Central Asia, Middle East, China, and the Eastern markets. Do you have a plan to leverage on that natural advantage? The plan is to create the enabling environment in Pakistan so that we can attract investors. Uh, not just foreign investors, not just overseas Pakistani investors, even our own investors who unfortunately because of our poor governance system were, were not really investing in Pakistan. We didn't even give them enough incentives and I'm talking about Pakistani investors. So we are restructuring our duty structure, we are uh, our tax incentives, we are restructuring everything so to incentivize people to invest. What are the sectors that you think investors would be more interested in in Pakistan? Uh, uh, minerals. There are a uh, vast amount of mineral wealth lying in Pakistan. Coal. We have one of the biggest coal reserves in the world. We have copper reserves, one of the biggest copper reserves, zinc. We have a lot of uh, uh, areas of uh, gas which have not been explored at all uh, but then we have tourism you see Pakistan is uh, one of the most diverse countries in the world Pakistan starts with alpine in the north we have alpine uh, 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 climate and then from the highest which is the second highest mountain in the world which is K2 we go on to the sea we have 12 climatic zones on the way so we have uh, uh, tourism has exploded in Pakistan. Uh, our infrastructure cannot cope with the tourists. So that's one of the biggest opportunities to invest in our country. And then we have three types of tourism. We have religious tourism. Uh, north of Pakistan was the center of the Buddhist civilization. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, the oldest civilization in the world, which is the Indus Valley civilization in Mohenjo-Daro, Peshawar is one of the oldest living cities in the world, two and a half thousand years old. Lahore also one of the ancient cities. So Pakistan is a diverse country. It's uh, unfortunately because of the war on terror, last uh, 13, 14 years we had this turmoil where uh, tourism disappeared. But in the last two years we have, bro all records of tourism have been broken in our country. So that's a great area to invest. So you've mentioned two points, tourism and energy. You've, you've spoken enough about uh, tourism and what uh, should happen and how the investment should be. But on housing, energy, housing is also, of course, uh, uh, five million houses we are building. That's another area we, we're expecting investment from abroad. Uh, let, let me talk about energy because I think finding um, a sustainable fuel and gas supply by investing in Pakistan's, Pakistan's own production is vital for your economy. Uh, what's your plan to reducing energy dependency and really inviting international investors and local investors to, in, to invest in that particular field? You see, we, we have hardly um, had any investment in our, in our mineral resources. And one of the reasons, as I said again, in the last 15 years was this war on terror where, um, you know, we, we became the center of uh, 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 terrorism, suicide attacks. And so, you know, investors would not come to Pakistan. Uh, then we, you know, we had uh, last 10 years, very poor governance, corruption. We did not give enough incentives for uh, investors to come to our, Pakistan, to our country. Now, thanks to our security forces, our intelligence agencies, uh, Pakistan has controlled terrorism. It's within Pakistan now, we have really clamped down on terrorism. It's uh, very secure. We still have problems, terrorists, terrorism coming from Afghanistan. But that's why we are hoping that these peace talks, hopefully peace talks between Taliban and the Americans, we hope that once Afghanistan settles, then not only will there be no terrorism within Pakistan, but then we have the success all the way uh, to Central Asia. So uh, uh, we did not have investment coming into our uh, 
uh, gas into uh, other minerals because we, did, we had turmoil in our country. Now with uh, peace and stability, we have people coming in. We have some of the big giants in, um, in the energy sector now showing interest. In fact, in December, uh, I think Exxon is coming uh, in Pakistan. They're coming back to Pakistan. Uh, and, and also we want to give incentives for the uh, people in the uh, investors in the energy sector to come and invest in our country. Um, Your Excellency, from here, from the FII, what message do you want to give the world about Pakistan? The message is that uh, Pakistan is a country with uh, great potential. In the 60s, Pakistan was growing faster than almost any country in Asia, and that's because we had the best governance system. We unfortunately lost our way. Uh, we, in the 80s, we ended up in, uh, in what was the Afghan Jihad. We then had remnants of the Afghan Jihad throughout the 90s. 9-11, Post 9-11, we suffered from terrorism. And then uh, of, we, our governance system also, unfortunately, did not enable us to attract an investment. Now Pakistan, in my opinion, is ready. I repeat, the biggest resource in Pakistan are the 100 million Pakistanis below the age of 35. It's a huge potential in the country. Uh, we have a diverse, mineral-rich country one of the most fertile plants in the Indus Valley Basin. So today the country stands uh, where it is probably right now is the best time for investors to come to our country. Thank you very much. I'm going to open the floor now for some questions. We've got um, around 10 minutes. So uh, if you have any questions, please just uh, mention your name and your institution. We've got some mics. I think I was very comprehensive. Yeah. We've, we've got so many questions. Can we just pass the mics, please? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Your Excellency, welcome to Saudi Arabia. Okay, welcome. Uh, Saudi Arabia businessmen are really very much looking at investment opportunities in Pakistan. We have a lack of information. I think we need to strengthen the economic section of the Pakistani embassy in Saudi Arabia so that uh, the Saudi businessmen have full information. We believe, from our experience, with the expertise of Pakistanis working in Saudi Arabia, who really shared with us our experience of development, they really show a potential to build a great country in Pakistan, like helping, helping us to build a great country in Saudi Arabia. So we are looking forward to get more information about Pakistan because many Saudi businessmen are interested for investment in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have uh, spoken to Prince, His Highness Prince Salman and um, he is already organizing uh, businessmen from Saudi Arabia to come to Pakistan to invest. So we look forward. I'll take two more questions. Okay. Hi, Imran. I'm Vikram from Tech Mahindra. Very inspirational talk. Uh, you did mention about 100, 100 million people below the age of 30. And, don't, and you mentioned about minerals and oil and gas. Uh, don't you think information technology also could be an avenue for Pakistan? Uh, yes, Vikram. Information technology could be one area where we could not only uh, improve our exports but also provide employment to our young people. Uh, unfortunately, we did not concentrate, like India did, 
in information technology. We've got left a bit behind, but now we are concentrating, we're having organizing our IT sector so we can um, uh, develop it. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Khan Saab. My name is Kashif Khan. I'm a private equity and uh, investor in, uh, from the Middle East. My question to you is uh, a lot of investors have invested previously in the past into Pakistan economy. The biggest challenge they have is exiting out of those investments. How this government will facilitate uh, the previous investors to exit, which will give more confidence to the future investors? Uh, well, Kashif, I have my team here. Our chairman of board of investment is here, our finance minister, uh, our commerce minister. The whole idea is, in Pakistan right now, is how to make it easier for people to invest, the ease of doing business. Uh, we are already working on it, uh, trying to remove all impediments. In fact, we are now about to develop a one-window operation for investors that anyone who wants to invest in Pakistan, he will just be able to contact a one point where they can contact, and any problems they are having, we will remove. So uh, we are now determined that the only way the country can go forward and we can provide employment to this young population is by helping the investors. And uh, you will find things improving by the day. So we will have one more question before we wrap up. Other Hanyan from Mindshare Capital. Hello. Asalaamu As Alaikum, Your Excellency. Welcome to Riyadh. Um, Pakistan is one of the largest importers of oil, and Saudi being one of the largest exporters. So isn't, can you uh, maybe shed light on the possibilities of potential cooperation in oil refineries or downstream opportunities uh, in manufacturing in Pakistan? Well, we are already um, talking to Saudi investors for an oil refinery uh, to be built in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, in fact, we need two oil refineries uh, in Pakistan bearing the amount of demand. So yes, the answer is yes, we are talking to Saudi Arabia. We have uh, already met Saudi investors who just came over to Pakistan. And there is cooperation, and there's going to be increasing cooperation between uh, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. So we have one more question. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, over here. Heather Henyon from Mindship Capital. Um, just to ask about the gender strategy for Pakistan. We know that women have played a very strong role in microfinance, in the business of Pakistan, and in the formal economy of Pakistan. Can you talk more about the role that you see for women going forward as entrepreneurs and their role in the business sector? Thank you. Uh, the most important thing at the moment for our government is to ensure that we raise uh, a female literacy in our country. Unfortunately, we, well, in literacy, we have got left behind in the subcontinent, but specifically female literacy. So you can only empower women, really, if you educate them. So in, our, uh, in the five years which we, when we were in power in Khabar Pakhtunkhwa, the province we, our government was in power, we decided that every uh, 100 new colleges to be built in Khabar Pakhtunkhwa 70 would be for women. Similarly, in primary, all primary education schools which we were going to open, out of uh, 100, 70 would be for women. So that's number one. Secondly, we have uh, this housing project which we've started. We are uh, at the bottom tier, we are doing microfinance for the poorest of the poor. This is affordable housing. And for the poorest of the poor, we are, we are introducing microfinance. And there also we are involving women because we find that they are always in microfinance, they always pay back the loans much, uh, uh, much uh, better than the, 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 the ratio which men pay back. But 
apart from that, uh, we also we're trying to do something which uh, sadly hasn't happened in Pakistan. Women do not get their inheritance rights, which is mentioned in the Sharia. In Pakistan, in uh, rural areas, women don't get their rights. So also financially empower them by ensuring that they get their, that their inheritance rights. So oh, we, we've got another, another question, please. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this has been Hindi from Dubai, UAE. You have a great neighbor next to you, which is India, and they have great potentials to be a great partners with you. What is your efforts to let go all the past history and become one big nation collaborating with each other in different fields and businesses? Thank you. Well, I'll um, answer my final question. Look, one thing Pakistan needs more than any other country right now is peace and stability. The last uh, decade or more, specifically after 9-11, has been of the greatest turmoil to our country. Uh, a war which Pakistan had nothing to do with, Pakistan ended up losing almost uh, 80,000 Pakistanis dead. Uh, our tribal areas devastated by the war. Half of the population in the tribal areas internally displaced. Over a hundred billion dollars lost to the economy. And one of the reasons why we are at the stage where I'm talking about the two biggest deficits, fiscal and, and current account deficit, is because of this instability and the war, where investors, investment just dried up in Pakistan. So what we need is stability. Now, stability means peace with all its neighbors. We have two, we have peace with India, we have peace with Iran, uh, peace with China and Iran. Our problems are right now with Afghanistan and with India. Now, when I uh, uh, won the elections and came to power, the first thing I tried to do was to extend a hand of peace to India. Unfortunately, and I think it's because of the Indian election coming up, and because, sadly, anti-Pakistan rhetoric brings in votes, I'm afraid we got no response from India. In fact, uh, got rebuffed by India. Now, what we are hoping is that we'll wait till the elections, then again we will resume our peace talks with India. Uh, peace with India is important not just for Pakistan, but for India as well. Uh, all the money that should be diverted to your, our human resources ends up being diverted to non-productive arms, arms race. And secondly, uh, peace with Afghanistan, peace in Afghanistan. It's critical for Pakistan because at the moment, the, the, the amount of, the low amount of terrorism coming into Pakistan is from Afghanistan. And so it's for, for us, for Pakistan, it's extremely important that we have peace with both the neighbors. And I can tell you, my government will be trying its best we are all in, in Pakistan. There is a consensus amongst all stakeholders that what this country right now needs peace and stability. And only peace and stability will allow us to bring in investment to, uh, to most of all, to alleviate poverty, give employment to our young population. So we will wrap it here. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank and thank you for uh, sharing with us all this. The Prime Minister of Pakistan, thank you.